Soldiers of the Light. Yeah, yeah. They playing the song in Zambia today. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are the warriors of Christ. Yeah, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are, we are the warriors of Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. From Africa to America, we beating on the drum, singing praises in the name of the Lord. His spirit makes us one. Let's celebrate and rejoice in His name. United, we all the same. Let's sing out loud with the beat of the drums. His message will never change. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are the warriors of Christ. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We are, we are, we are, we are, we are. out here on Father's Day of 95, they were with us that week. They'd also been with us the previous year. And uh, I'll tell you, these guys, pastors and, and uh, church leaders, listen, these guys can not only sing, but they all can preach. They all can preach. I mean, they can preach the gospel. I'd like to encourage you while they're here to, uh, if you can, you know, get a booking with them because these men will be a blessing to your church. I mean, they will be a blessing. They were a tremendous blessing to Brownsville. I've asked them to do one more song, and uh, is, is that all set to go? They're going to do one more song. This is a song about America. You can be seated. I believe this will bless your heart. Amen. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity to minister this morning. We are your missionaries from South Africa, and God's been great to us. Uh, do we have any pastors from Northern California? All right, we were just for 10 days in revival in Northern California, Chico, Corning, and uh, Susanville. I'm telling you, we saw the hand of God moving. Whew. I'm telling you. You see, we're just an extension of this church. Amen. This is a home church in Florida. But uh, Sister Gilpatrick went to England. What a wonderful, I just saw that right up. And here God is sending us back to Africa in Zambia. But God has called us to your country. America has become a mission field. And listen to the song that God gave us about two, three years ago. It says, Lord, 
Revive America again. Let's sing it, brother. Lord, revive America again. Two hundred years or more, America was born. She was founded on the word of God. So many has fallen away. Since that historic day But people of the red, white and blue Nations are praying for you Lord revive America again Let her be the lighthouse of the world One more time Even if you have Lord, please revive her again. Mighty men and women of God were born in the land of the free, raising up a standard for the sake of liberty. So many others have taken this gospel through this world. But America, you've turned your back on God. America, you've got to turn around. If you humble yourself in the sight of God, then He will heal your land. Lord, revive America again. Let her be the light. One more time, but even if you have to bring her to her knees, then Lord, please revive her again. America, America, God shed His grace on thee. America again. Let her be the lighthouse of the world one more time. But even if you have to bring her to her knees, then Lord, please revive her. Can be seated but stay in an attitude of worship we're gonna open up the word in just a few minutes I believe the message the McGregor's just ministered is dear to every heart here everyone here even if you're visiting from out of the country you have a burden for America and for all of you from out of the country know that we have a burden for your country I've asked uh, my friend Brad Kaufman to minister continue to minister in music and worship to us. Brad is a former student of mine from Christ for the Nations in New York, and we've had a close relationship for years. He traveled with me as I went to some different nations, and 
uh, throughout America. We got to travel together, and he would minister in music before I'd speak. So uh, you may not know the songs because these are all original songs that he's written. Um, but the Lord will minister to you if you want to just enter in and worship or kneel down and pray or stand. Feel free. But open your heart to the Lord. Without rain. 
this world he has made Do the cares of this life Seem to push aside The need for the lost to get saved But they're dying Without him And they're crying Free from their sin, gotta take the good news to them. He's made us fishers of men, gotta take the good news to them. We've gotta tell.
Stand again, please, all over the building. Hallelujah. God bless you, brother. That was wonderful. Thank you very much. We're going to hear in just a moment from uh, Mike Brown. He's the dean of our school, the Brownsville School of Revival. We started this school because it was such a need of having some kind of an educational process for these people that God is bringing in. He's raising them up, saving them, calling many into the ministry. And uh, we, our first graduating class will be in 1999. Isn't that unusual? And uh, as of this fall semester, already it looks like we're going to have around 500 students signed up for the fall semester. It's a two-year school, two-year college. And uh, we feel like that the blessings of the Lord is on this. We'd like to encourage you, if you have people in your church that you would like to entrust into our care, and they're looking for some kind of an education, a Christian education. We don't feel like that they could come to a better place. The expenses are not that much at all. We try to keep all the expenses low, all the overhead is low. And uh, many times after they come out of this school, we believe that they'll go into uh, some of our other colleges around the country, Christian colleges, maybe even for a four-year degree. But at the moment, this is a two-year degree, and um, they're getting a good, well-rounded, Bible-based education. So we would love for you to consider that if you have any people in your church that would like to go to a Bible college. Today our speaker is uh, Reverend Mike Brown, Dr. Mike Brown. Mike is not only our friend and he's not only a colleague here on the staff of this church, but Mike is uh, a scholar in his own right in the Christian world today. God has laid his hand mightily on this man. He not only is brilliant, but Mike has a heart that impresses everybody that he meets. He's an humble man. And uh, you'll see him up there on the platform when the Spirit of God begins to move. He'll dance freely and loosely. And I love to see him dance before the Lord. And I wonder today, would you please welcome a, a dear friend of ours and a great man of God and a gift to the body of Christ, Dr. Michael Brown. Bless the Lord. Wonderful to be with you this morning. Wonderful to have the power on. Amen. It always takes them a couple of seconds to get the sound set when I speak. So I want to first ask how many of you cannot hear me? Please raise your hand. That's the one question you cannot, that's like someone got up one night and asked me, they said, we have some Spanish ministers here, could you get up and announce, this is at the altar, if anyone needs Spanish translation, you don't understand English, please raise your hand. And I was just about ready to do it. But as you heard, brilliant as I am, very quick on my feet, I realized somewhere between there and here that that announcement wouldn't work. Well, it is uh, wonderful to be with you. I thought that if the power was not on today, that this message would become legendary. You know, when, when you don't have the tape to go back to and the video to, video to go back to, then you kind of just build on the memory. And soon it becomes, were you there that I was there? But unfortunately, we have it all on tape and video, so we'll find out the way it really happened. Bless the Lord. I just want to announce to, to you that uh, uh, my friend Brad is a full-time worship leader and on staff at a, a church of dear friends of mine in New Jersey. I only mention that so that you, you don't ask him to come and minister. Uh, 
I did want to say that to you. Just a couple of other quick things while they're still getting this set. See, we have the pre-message voice, which they struggle with. And then after I pray, something happens to my voice and, and the sound comes out differently. So while they're struggling with that, uh, I want to encourage all of you, go over to our book table. There's a free printed message. You hear that free, guys? Free? <laughs> a, uh... <laughs> A, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, I take I back everything I said about you, brother. <laughs> See, I was just about to say one of the most special things about being here is not just being in the midst of revival, but I mean this seriously. We just love one another. We do. We enjoy one another. We, you know, I, I boast about the workers here all the time. It's just, it's amazing to see and just, you know, the, the joy we have serving together, pouring our hearts out together, looking in one another's eyes with tears and with rejoicing. I, I've never had a, just such a, an easy, deep relationship with, with men of God as we have here. And, you know, uh, just to give you a hint about the strength of the revival, I'll come back to this free thing in a minute. I'm Jewish, you know, it's hard to talk about things that are free, but uh, I'll come back to it in a minute though. But, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, Benny won't mind me saying this. You see his wife Hazel here on the worship team, uh, tall with uh, longer black hair. They have seven kids, and they're good parents, and they homeschool their kids. Hazel homeschools the kids, and they're right in the thick of revival here. You'll see Charlie, our usher that helps us back and forth on the, the platform here and brings water and so on. He's a married man with family. They're here in the revival every night. He's an auto mechanic. He works seven to five daily. That's when he's at his job. So he leaves his house 6.15, 6.30, gets home 5.15, 5.30, takes a few minutes nap and gets here, serves joyfully. That's the strength of this revival. Volunteers, retired people pouring in hours here. It's phenomenal. It's, I've never seen anything like this. Just, and everyone just rejoices to be able to serve. And I was with Charlie one day. He was just doing some work on my car and he gets paid basically by work produced. And in the week I was with him, he was literally working 45 hours, but he put out over 100 hours of work in the 45 hours. Nobody in the shop had ever done anything like that. I think it was 103 and a half hours, thriving in the midst of it. You want to know a strength of this revival? It's that people just have a heart to serve and a heart to give. And you know, you may see us on the platform here pouring ourselves out night after night, but our heroes are these servants. The people that don't get paid to do any of this and just pour out their hearts day and night. And, uh, you know, if you're just in it to get, 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 you'll never have revival. When you're in it to give, 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 you'll see God move. Yeah. Amen? Speaking of giving, 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 I guess that gets me back to this. Uh, I've got a book that should be out beginning of July that's going to be on confronting the critics of revival. It's just about finished, but there's a message that's an important message for all of you leaders to get. It's called Scorning the Sacred. When critics enter the danger zone, please take a copy for your church. Feel free and make as many copies of it as you want, okay? It's an important word. We felt in leadership that, that you should be sure to get it, so I want to encourage you to do that. And also, we have something else free. <clears throat> a, uh, get one of these brochures on the school. We may have 800 or 1,000 students in the fall. We don't know. It's almost mind-boggling to see the interest. Keep our housing situation in prayer. We have more people coming than we know where to put. So the earlier we get names in and on the list, the, the more we can help. But God's going to provide for everyone. And uh, we have a bunch of radicals without apology, without compromise. We're ready to go for it. And um, so grab one of the brochures on the school and get one of these um, uh, free messages. And since everybody else plugged their materials, don't leave without buying. Everyone say buying. So if, Make sure you get this book, From Holy Laughter to Holy Fire. It's critically important on removing the roadblocks to revival. It'll show you the main hindrances to revival, give you a picture of what revival is really about, and inspire you to go for it. Uh, you'll see the relevance of this book as if it was written right into your life today. It'll charge you uh, and, and encourage you and challenge you. There are a number of other books we have related to revival. I, I mention every Friday that you can get the six of them at a discount. However, being Jewish, it's not the biggest discount, but you can... You can get those, and um, I, I am required by my wife to give a warning 
before people get to our book table that I have a full-length scholarly study on God the Healer, the first full-length scholarly study ever done, but it's technical. It's not for everybody. And you know why we sell a lot of these books to pastors? I'm just going to tell you honestly, then we'll get into the Word. See, people at our table are told when someone comes and picks up this book, it's got 85,000 words just in the end notes. When someone picks up this book, the people at the table are told to tell you, now this is only for serious students of the Word. Problem is you got that pastor's badge on. What are you going to do? Oh, I guess it's not for me. I'm just a pastor. I'm just a simple teacher. I'm an evangelist. So, of course, you have to buy the book at that point. You can't put, so we release you from any feeling of pressure when they tell you this is only for serious students of the word. And look in your eyes. You can put the book down without any sense of guilt. Of course, it'll be to your loss if you do. But, uh... All right, I, I have a... Uh... A, a strong word from the Lord that he's laid on my heart, and I have uh, a word from uh, Cheryl, who's the conference coordinator here. Uh, in these conferences, she's just under God, basically. If you have a word from God, that rules over that, and then just under that is if Cheryl tells you something. <laughs> so she told me if the Holy Spirit moves. We went a little overtime yesterday. We weren't exactly clear on, on the time frame and, and uh, unintentionally went a little later, but she said if the Lord moves, that's fine. So at the end of this message, that, that was nice of Cheryl telling the Lord if he moves, that's fine. We appreciate that spirit. But uh, <laughs> uh, so Lord, it's open. <laughs> But um, if, if it's uh, appropriate to have a response at the end of this message, uh, and there is a time for response, then, then um, just remember that uh, the, w there'll be another session. What time does the next session start? Anyone know? What time does the next session start? Starts immediately after this. Oh, so there's no time pressure. Okay. Um, but if there is, if... <laughs> We'll, we will be time conscious, and it, but if, if there is a need to respond, you can do so and, um, and then uh, still get out at, at the same time we got out yesterday. Let's, let's agree together in prayer. Father, we honor you, God of all. And you said in your word that in these New Testament days, you speak to us from heaven by your spirit and your word. May your thundering voice from heaven speak your word which is like fire and like a hammer that shatters the rock in pieces, your word which is sharper than any double-edged sword, your word which is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. May your word come forth with clarity and may we not deceive ourselves by being hearers only, but may we be blessed, Father, by putting into practice the things that your word says. Answer us with power today in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want you to go to Galatians, the first chapter. I want to talk to you about qualities of revival leadership today. The name of this message is Politicians, Professionals, or Prophets. Politicians, Professionals, or Prophets. Let me just say that if any of this message wounds you, it's only so as to heal you. If the Lord gets under your skin and challenges you and exposes something that's wrong, it's only so that he can make you whole and strong. It's only so that you can come out better in the long run for the glory of God. And I want to read to you from Galatians 1. This is a unique epistle, contrary to the other epistles of Paul. He does not praise the Galatians for anything. He doesn't give them encouraging, positive words, positive words or anything like that. He just glorifies the Lord and says he's called by God and then goes right after them because their situation was so serious. And we read what Paul wrote here and we learn something about Paul, his character and his walk before God. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle, sent not from men nor by men but by Jesus Christ and God the Father who raised him from the dead and all the brothers with me to the churches in Galatia, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ 
who gave himself for our sins to rescue us from the present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. I am astonished that you are so quickly deserting the one who called you by the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Christ. But if e even if we or an angel from heaven should preach a gospel other than the one we preached to you, let him be eternally condemned. As we have already said, so now I say again, if anybody is preaching to you a gospel other than what you accepted, let him be eternally condemned. That is the background to verse 10. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God? Friends, that's not how you write when you're trying to please men. This is not how to make friends and influence people. It's how to please God. Am I now trying to win the approval of men or of God, or am I trying to please men? If I were still trying to please men, I would not be a servant of the Messiah. Politicians, professionals, or prophets. I want to tell you the characteristics of leaders who lead like politicians. You remember when the authority of Jesus was questioned, by what authority do you do this? And he said, I'll ask you a question, and then you answer mine, and then I'll answer yours. He said, John the Baptist, by what authority did he do what he did? And they began to reason one with another and said, if we say, because Jesus wanted to be specific, was it from heaven, was it from God, or was it from men? And they said to themselves, if we say from heaven, then he'll say, then why didn't you follow him? If we say it was of man, it was only human, then the crowds will be angry with us because they all love John. So they said, we can't answer. Not because they didn't have a conviction, not because they didn't have a belief. They didn't believe John was sent from heaven. Maybe deep down they knew it in their heart, but they weren't admitting to it. They said, no, he wasn't sent from heaven. Then why didn't they speak it up? They said, we can't answer you. Why couldn't they answer? Because they were not so much concerned with truth as with how the answer would play. And Jesus said, therefore, I won't answer you either. He wasn't being cute with them, but he was exposing what was in their hearts. And he was showing that they wouldn't really hear his answer. Politicians make decisions based on consensus and opinion and not on the will of God. Leaders who lead like politicians will try and sense where are the people at. I'm not talking about having a heart of compassion for the flock. I'm not talking about being sensitive to the needs of the people and realizing the people are being driven too hard. The flock is being hurt. People aren't being cared for and ministered to. I'm not talking about that. Everyone in ministry is called to shepherd on some capacity, some level or another, regardless of whether you're a full-time evangelist or a full-time pastor. Everyone in ministry is called to shepherd the flock in some way. And we must have a heart of sensitivity to the people and know their needs. That's one thing. But there's a line that's crossed, and pastors begin to think, if I preach this, how will the people respond? If God starts to move in revival power, what impact will that have? What about the old timers who give a lot? What about the prestige members of the church? What will the community think? How will this play? Politicians are pursuing the crowd instead of following the cloud. They're more concerned with offending people. I don't want to offend you, but they'll offend God. They will calculate the effect that their message will have upon people. I don't mean you go to God and you say, Lord, I want this word to hit home and bring repentance. I don't mean that. The politician will say, if I preach this series, then it will disorient this group of people because they don't like when I go in this direction. If God really begins to move in power and it takes us out of the, the regular structure of our service, the fixed time period, people will get uneasy and they'll start to go to another church because that church runs like a clock. I often refer to what Vance Havner, a Baptist leader, said many years ago about his Baptist friends. He said, we Baptists start at 11 o'clock sharp 
and then the 12 o'clock dull. Some people may say, well, if God really starts moving in my church and our service doesn't get out for three or four hours, then I might start to lose the people. It's exactly what Saul, King Saul did. But the people, God said do this, but the people. Are you a politician? Politicians have no core governing convictions. Things for which they're willing to lose everything. Paul could say, I don't count my own life dear. You know, when people wanted to take his life, he said, you can't take my life. I've already lost my life. You can't take my reputation. I've already lost my reputation. I die daily. I die to the things that once held me. I die to the things that were once so big to me. He said, I count it all loss and rubbish that I can win Christ, that I can have him. That's what I care about. That I can enter into the fellowship of his sufferings and the power of his resurrection, that I can know him. You can't add to me, you can't take away from me. That's, <coughs> that's the opposite of a political leader. What does a politician do? Well, he looks at the polls. They're great pollsters. Talk about this because this is where the people are at. Talk about this. Flip flop, flip flop. Some of you have to look at your lives and realize that's how you lived for years in leadership. Flip flop, flip flop. Why hasn't God moved in power? Because he can't trust you with a move sometimes. Wasn't God come more deeply? Because he knows that you have more of an ear to the people than to God. Your orientation is more horizontal than vertical. And that's a curse for effective ministry. That's a block to revival, friends. The politician starts with good intent. He feels a burden. He wants to get into office. He wants to improve the country. He wants to improve his community. But then, if he's a typical politician, thank God for godly politicians, but for them to rise up high takes the hand of God. Because the political world is, all right, I'm going to compromise here a little bit to bring you in, and you'll help me with some campaign funds, and I'm going to compromise a little to bring you in, and you'll help get the votes out, so by the time he gets in power, he's completely ruled by the people because they're financing him and they're voting for him. Friends, is that the way you lead your church? What are your core governing convictions? Have you departed from them through the years? Are you one person in the secret place alone with God and your wife knows the convictions or your husband knows the convictions that are deep within you and then you get around the other leaders and you get around the people and you're not that same person anymore? Political leaders, they get paralyzed. In order to get to the top, in order to get ahead, they lose and leave the things that were once sacred to them. You don't know what they stand for anymore. They go as the wind blows. The exact opposite of the spirit of revival, friends. Politicians put loyalty to their party. You can say their denomination, their church, their organization, their group. They put that above loyalty to God and loyalty to the truth. Thank God when a whole denomination embraces what God is doing. That's wonderful. That's awesome. Thank God when leaders who've been around for a whole generation embrace what God's doing in the next generation. Thank God for that. But friends, if they don't, you got to go with God anyway. If no one else goes, if the church group doesn't go, I'm not talking about being independent mavericks. I'm talking about after you wrestle with it because you're an accountable person, because you love authority, because you love submission, because you want to do what's right, because you don't want to go against the grain. And you've gone through every channel you can go and you've made every appeal you can make. If people aren't going to go with God, I'm going to go with him, period. You'll never see revival unless you have that attitude. You may have to die to all the things that were so precious to you in this relationship, in that relationship. Say, God, I'll follow you no matter what. And all those people may come along anyway. But the Lord may take you alone and say, will you follow me? And you look at your whole life and you realize what it means. He can do that alone in your bedroom. Will you follow me? And you know the consequences. You know what it means to take up the cross. 
See, the politician is a stranger to the cross. Politicians are man-fearers and man-pleasers. Paul said here, if I yet please men, I would not be the servant of the Messiah. Because pleasing men was going on in his religion. Pleasing men was going on with what was comfortable. Oh, God, send revival. He says, do you really want revival? Do you know that it means the refiner's fire coming into your midst? Do you know that it means deep repentance and searching of heart? Doesn't just mean people added to the body. Doesn't just mean excitement and miracles. It means God coming. We've often said it's not just a divine visitation, it's a divine visitor. You know what it means to have God rule in your midst? I was praying one day and had a prayerful attitude, was just chatting with my wife about a certain church. Why hasn't revival come? It seems they want God to move so much. And I felt the Lord say to me, the reason that revival doesn't come to many churches is because the pastors still rule on Sunday. In other words, God, you're free to move in our midweek service and you're free to move at this special meeting, but Sunday morning when we have the whole crowd, when we get our tithes and offerings, when we have the establishment, can't move on Sunday. Wouldn't it be just like the Lord when your senior supervisor from your denomination happens to be visiting, that that's the day God speaks to your heart and says, dance like David. Dance like David. One pastor was talking about this, and I paraphrased it a little bit. I told him I'll write a chapter in a book one day about it. He said he was embarrassed to dance for two reasons. One was just dancing. The other was he was shaping out, filling out a little bit. He's going to write a chapter called Paunchy Pastors with Bouncing Bellies. Dance anyway. Dance anyway. What if it's the day when that respected friend from you knew in high school and now this person is a, a multi-millionaire, top business person, doesn't know the Lord. What if that's the day they show up and that's, they're sitting over there and your mother-in-law is sitting over there and this visiting pastor who's very much opposed to what you're doing but he's in town and he figures he's going to check it out and that's the day God says, just lay hands on everybody in the building. Or that's the day God says, preach on hell on Sunday morning. Are you going to please God or are you going to please man? My book, How Saved Are We? I just wrote something. I want to read it to you. Twelve spirit-shaped radicals could do more to turn our society right side up than 12 million man-made replicas. We're producing disciples of man. They're lacking conviction and backbone. They're spineless and easily swayed. We need God's image, the Messiah's image in our midst. Listen to what Catherine Booth said. Leonard Ravenhill gave me her series of sermons years back. I'm sure you've had them for years, Steve. These things are on fire. Aggressive Christianity and other sermons. Listen to what Catherine Booth said, the wife of William Booth, founded the Salvation Army. Here is the reason why we have such a host of stillborn, sinuous, rickety, powerless spiritual children. They are born of half-dead parents a sort of sentimental religion which does not take hold of the soul, which has no depth of earth, no grasp, no power in it, and the result is a sickly crop of sentimental converts. I wish she'd make herself more clear. <laughs> oh, the Lord give us a real, robust, living, hearty Christianity full of zeal and faith, which shall bring into the kingdom of God lively, well-developed children full of life and energy instead of these poor, sentimental ghosts that are hopping around us. We will reproduce who we are, friends. It's an irreversible law of the kingdom. Everything produces after its own kind. Yes. Let me tell you one other characteristic of a politician. Because of the horizontal orientation, we know I mean, no one here is so carnal to think like this. And I know this doesn't apply to any of you at, at our wonderful minister's conference, but there are some people out there that are actually moved by money. I know it applies to none of us here. There are some people who are so carnal 
that they think if I start preaching like this, if God starts moving, and again, I'm not talking about being insensitive and driving people off with your own agenda. I'm not talking about just trying to have chaos and calling it revival. God forbid. But I'm talking about being obedient to God and preaching what he says to preach and letting his spirit move how his spirit wants to move. There's no one here that's so carnal as to actually think like this, but there are some ministers out there. They think, well, if I start preaching like this, then some people will leave, and if they leave, they will take their money with them. There's some evangelists who think, if I preach like this, then no one will invite me to speak, and what am I going to do? Of course, no one here. That doesn't apply to anyone here. There's no one here so carnal. But just in case... Just in case, hear me. Politicians have a Judas spirit in them. You know what that is? You betray Jesus for money. If you are ever tempted to look at finances and offerings to gauge if you're going to obey God or not, if you're ever tempted, if I go in this direction, Lord, what's going to happen to the money? And yes, God always does take care of you, but if he didn't, it'd be better to work a secular job and obey him than to compromise and stay in ministry. But if you are ever tempted to compromise over money, remember, you're no better than Judas if you do it because he portrayed the Lord for 30 pieces of silver. Are you a politician? Second class of defective leaders, professionals, professionals. Professionals make up for lack of anointing with skill and polish. They are entertainers. Let me tell you about James Alexander Stewart, Scottish revivalist, used mightily by God in particular before World War II in Eastern Europe, saw revival in different countries. I was amazed. I wrote some things in my book, How Saved Are We? And a missionary friend in Italy said, have you ever read this by James Alexander Stewart? And it was almost word for word, some of the sentences, the same bird, the same heart. I was amazed. And I started to devour his stuff. He was a boy preacher. God called him to ministry when he was about 14, 15 years old. And he started preaching in Columbia Records heard about him, and they had a a young gospel singer, a boy gospel singer, and now they wanted a boy preacher. So they said to Stuart, we are going to get your message out around the world on record. You preach your message, you you just preach it the way you want, we're going to put it on record and we're going to send it around the world, and your message will go everywhere. And this was a dream come true. And he went and told his mother, and his mother Didn't feel right about it. He was really upset because she could not see that he had the opportunity of a lifetime. And he went to pray, and you know the revelation he got? He said, Satan was trying to make me into a professional evangelist. It struck me, man, that's almost the norm in America. Listen to what Stewart said. I'm not saying this to sell the book. I already gave the pitch, but I'm saying this so you know where it is because people always ask me. It's in the chapter, Fit for the Master's Use. Listen to what he says. He's talking about modern evangelistic meetings. He probably wrote this 40 years ago. He said, the atmosphere of these meetings is so much like Hollywood that one might almost expect some comedian or film star to rush on the platform. Struck me, we do have comedians and film stars rush on the platform. We got to bring in some kind of trophy to highlight the meeting, some kind of sensational special guest. In fact, if we could have, you know, a guy, you know, we've got professional boxers that are Christians. Maybe we could have a murderer who's a Christian. Of course, he's still a murderer, but what a testimony. Or a mafia leader who's a Christian. You may have detected a tinge of sarcasm in my voice there. I'll just keep going with that. If you missed it, you missed it. But we've got to bring, we've got to have all the setup. Friends, you heard it last night, you don't have to advertise a fire. Leonard Ravenhill was asked, or John Wesley was asked, how do you draw the crowds? He said, I set myself on fire and people come to watch me burn. 
When God's moving, I had always believed it for years, and now we're seeing it proved out. When God's moving, I, I'd seen in other countries, we'd preach a heavy repentance message, and the leaders would be thinking, nobody's going to come tomorrow, and the crowd would be double the next night. Preach on the wrath of God and judgment and warn people to get right with God, and the crowd would be double the next night. Why? Because God's anointing is on that message, and as you proclaim the cross and warn people of coming judgment, God will deal with the people, and the hunger of the people will draw them. No, we've got to have a special this, a special this, and, and, and the right elements to bring the people in. Friends, that's the flesh. Much of what goes on in the Church of America today is man's best effort to make up for the lack of the presence of God. Listen to what Stewart said. I refuse to entertain sinners on their way to hell. I want to preach every time as though it were my last chance. I do not want souls to curse my name in the lake of fire and say, yes, I went to such and such a gospel meeting, but that preacher Stewart only entertained and joked he made Christianity a farce. Stewart said the old-fashioned method of evangelism was to make people weep, but the modern Hollywood way is to make people laugh. Everybody has to have a jolly good time. We must have plenty of jokes or it would not be a good meeting. That is why there is such a woeful lack of conviction of sin in modern evangelism. The Holy Spirit cannot work in a frivolous atmosphere. How we need to hear that in the current wave of renewal. Yes. Folks from the nations, you may have been touched with renewal. Why is it so shallow? Because people just want to show. They just want to get blessed. They just want to have a good time. But there's not a passion for God's glory to come down and shake a country. Not a broken heart for a dying world. Not a burning desire for personal purity. Stewart says, here is a solemn truth that very few of God's people seem to see. Everything depends on the atmosphere of the meeting. For example, if you were saved in a jazzy sort of atmosphere, light and frivolous, with the song leader more like a clown, and the preacher merely glorifying himself and using fleshly effort, you will also turn out to be a jazzy, frivolous Christian with no depth in your spiritual life. Right. Friends, we're seeing people saved on fire, just living for God, turned around instantly, delivered from addictions of up to 40 years or drug habits of six or $800 a day, instantly delivered and going on on fire. That's the way they got saved. Yes. That's the only thing they know. Yes. They love to worship. They love to hear the word. They love to be convicted. They love to repent. They love to say, I want to live for God no matter what. Nobody told them that they're supposed to have it easy. Nobody told them that there was a choice. They could have the old cross or the new cross. Like Tozer said, the old cross kills the sinner, the new cross simply redirects him. No, they just heard there's one way, leave everything, follow Jesus. The old dies, you live to the new. And that's why they're living the way they're living, friends. But the professional minister, maybe you had an anointing at one point and then you slipped into that thing, you found, man, I'm a good speaker. Man, I, I know how to put a message here. Boy, I know how to administrate a church. Boy, I know how to sing. I know, boy, I know how to read. I know how to look in somebody's eye and touch them. And the compassion's gone and the fire's gone, the anointing's gone, but the skill is there. The professional emphasizes talents and appearance. In other words, outward fleshly things more than holiness and intimacy with God. You look at what consumes them. You have to look in your own heart and soul and say, what motivates me? Remember the words of Robert Murray McShane, it's not great talents God blesses so much as great likeness to Jesus that he blesses. A holy minister is an awful weapon in the hands of God. Thank God for all the good he's doing around the land. Thank God for all the good conferences and seminars and teachings but grieve over all the how-to things that are certain, that are simply fleshly techniques. Just little formulas. Listen, friends, when God's moving, you don't need formulas. You go through the Gospels and Acts, crowds were never a problem. The question is how to handle the crowds. If you suddenly developed a cure-all to cancer, one pill, it cost $10,000 for this one pill, but any cancer patient anywhere in the world could just take this one pill and be instantly cured of cancer for life. Friends, you wouldn't need a great marketing strategy. You wouldn't need two-for-one price specials. You could charge 100000 and you'd never make enough of those pills. One of my friends was watching a TV show 
talking about different techniques in churches today. And one man was saying, if Jesus were here today, he'd be doing it the way we do. Now, thank God for good equipment and musical excellence, and, and you do your best when you speak to present things clearly and so on. Sure, but you don't depend on the natural. You depend on God's anointing. You depend on your walk with God. You depend on the call, the burden of the Lord. And this fellow was saying if Jesus were here, this was a, a church that was so seeker sensitive that they were going to bring in everyone through drama, through this technique, through a marriage seminar. I always wonder at what point you tell them if they don't repent, they go to hell. At what point in the lovely seeker sensitive service in the midst of the drama and the music seminar, do you tell them unless you forsake everything you have, you cannot be a disciple of Jesus? And this fellow was saying, if Jesus were here today, he'd be doing it just like us with these giant screens for this and that. And sometimes you need a screen. Sometimes people can't see. I understand that. But I've wondered, you know, a church of a thousand people, why do they need three 40-foot screens? Don't look at me. Don't look at me. Just look at Jesus. It's a little hard, buddy, with those 40-foot screens around. I don't want to touch on anything controversial, guys. I'm just hit on the mainstream stuff. So my friend, Assembly of God pastor on Long Island, who was also a student as far as back in New York, he was watching this and this fellow was saying, if Jesus were here, he'd use all these things to bring in the people. My friend said, I don't think so. He said, I think he'd start laying his hands on a few sick folk. People start getting healed, man, the crowds would come flocking from everywhere. If one in ten blind people were healed, you wouldn't know what to do with the crowds. But the professional relies on all the externals and earthly things. Let me tell it to you straight. A new sound system will not bring revival. I'll hit myself where I live. A new computer system will not bring revival. A new office setting will not bring revival. Revival comes when you get on your face in desperation, realizing you've come to the end of your rope and say, God, unless you come down, it's over. See, it's the opposite of fleshly dependence. God says, well, you're doing just fine without me. Ravenhill said the problem in our modern churches is we worship an absentee God. Professionals separate, separate personal life from public ministry. I mean, a professional comedian, he gets up, he's going to make everybody laugh. He can be cruel and vicious and private. Or some beautiful, seductive singer, she's going to get up and smile and coo at everybody, and she can hate their guts. Professional pastors, evangelists, Maybe not quite as extreme, but it's the same thing. Personal life can be a shit. Listen, there are people, it boggles my mind, but there are people living in all types of ugly sin and get up and preach just like, oh, isn't he wonderful? And they'll get in people's faces sometimes. I, I, was, I was told by a friend of mine in the Spirit-filled Lutheran church that the pastor in that church was in adultery and the board confronted him over his adultery and he denied it and got angry and marched out and preached the message and at the end of his message the altars were filled with weeping people. It was human skill that did it. He knew how to move them, he knew how to manipulate them. Listen to me. Ministry is just the public extension of who you are in private. Let me say it again. Ministry is the public extension of who you are in private. Are you a professional? Can you say what Paul said in Philippians 4, 9 to the Philippians, the things you heard from me, the things you learned from me, the things you received from me, and the things you saw in me do, and the God of peace will be with you. Can you say with Paul, follow me as I follow the Messiah? Watch me and do it like I'd come along with me. Professional has lost the sense of burden and calling. 
He has a passion for the work. Oh, the church, the building, the evangelistic ministry. But the passion that motivated it to start isn't there anymore. That agonizing heart cry for the lost isn't there anymore. What's there is building the evangelistic ministry. Friends, there are a lot of temptations and traps out there. And the model we've had in America has not been the best. Man, I got such a heart for hurting people. God, you just got to let me go in ministry and pastor these people. And God calls you into ministry. But 20 years later, it's the new building. It's the reputation as the leader in the community. And the calling, the burden is gone. Professionals have a passion for personal reputation more than for the reputation of the Lord. Kingdom building with a small K, not with a capital K. Instead of rejoicing because the fire is falling somewhere else in the kingdom of God, that's not a colleague, that's a competitor. Professionals minister out of rote and routine, maybe faithfully. Now hear me, because this is a subtle one. Professionals minister out of rote and routine, maybe faithfully, maybe without ever missing a service, without ever missing a message, without ever missing a hospital visit. But they minister out of rote and routine in spite of scars and wounds which never get treated or whose roots never get addressed. Let me read that again. Professionals minister out of rote and routine in spite of scars and wounds which never get treated or whose roots are never addressed. You know what that means? God may look at you and say, you've been so faithful, you've been so loyal. You've been so hard working. You haven't quit even when you were hurt and beat up, but you haven't addressed what's happened to you on the inside because you become professional. You're preaching on faith, but you've long since become a skeptic. You're preaching on soul winning, but you've long since quit weeping for the lost. You're going on because you know you got to go on. And God said, would you stop and let me work on you on the inside? Yeah. Friends, you're not just a piece of meat to God. You're not someone he's just going to use and then throw out when he's done. You're precious in his sight. He knows the pressures you're under. He knows the difficulties. He knows the weakness of the flesh and the pressure of the world. He knows that sometimes financial pressure can weigh on people. He knows sometimes that it's disconcerting when you see your best friends walk out on you. He knows sometimes that the devil tries to set you up for the kill. He knows the pressure you're under. And he knows so many could be making all kinds of money or have all types of prestige or reputation by following another course, but you said, I'm following Jesus. You're not just a laborer for the Lord, you're a laborer with the Lord. Jesus says to you, if you do my Father's will, I call you my friends. He laid down his life for his friends. Make yourself vulnerable to God. The show does not have to go on. Do you hear what I'm saying? I thought back years ago when some of our best known televangelists were exposed, sexual sin and financial corruption. I don't know how you felt, I felt when they fell, we all fell. I said, oh my God, that's us. They could never have gotten where they were unless there was a church out there perpetuating that kingdom. But I remember thinking, boy, if one of them got on national television, broken, and said, I've sinned, I have blown it, I'm stepping down, but I know there are thousands of you out there doing the very same things. Follow my lead. Let's honor the Lord. Let's honor the church. Let's step down. If we can be restored and ever come back and serve, wonderful. But follow my lead. What would happen if people just made themselves vulnerable? I, I want to talk to you personally and honestly for a minute now it says in Malachi 1, God says that he would rather that the temple doors were shut than that people offered vain sacrifice. Let me ask you something. Who's making you do what you do? If you're really so hungry for revival, and I know you are, you wouldn't be here. If you're so desperate to see God move, if you want to see the glory of God come down, why not get up one Sunday and, and open your heart? And say, we need God. Friends, we don't have the formula. We don't have the answer. We need God to come down. Let's get on our faces and pray. We're going to set aside one night every week. I want every one of you to be here. We're just going to pray for revival. 
I'm starting a fast. We've got to see God come down. We're not just going on with the regular schedule. Who's stopping you from doing that? The show does not have to go on, friends. We've got to get real with God. If churches all over America just on one Sunday got on their faces and didn't go on with the normal schedule and said, oh, God, would you move? We're bankrupt. We're hurting. We need you. God would shake the nation. It would be a beginning. A spirit of repentance would be poured out. God would begin to deal with the foul ground. Do we really want revival, friends? You know the standard answer. We don't have revival because we're willing to live without it. Are you a professional? There's going to be opposition. There's going to be misunderstanding. Listen to what Finney said. If you have much of the Spirit of God, you must make up your mind to have much opposition, both in the church and the world. Very likely the leading men in the church will oppose you. There has always been opposition in the church. So it was when Christ was on earth. If you are far above their state of feeling, church members will oppose you. If any man will live godly in Christ Jesus, he must expect persecution, 2 Timothy 3.12. Often the elders and even the minister will oppose you if you are filled with the Spirit of God. And he said, if you don't have the Spirit or much of the Spirit, you will be much troubled with fears about fanaticism. Whenever there are revivals, you will see in them a strong tendency to fanaticism and will be full of fear and anxiety. We've said many times in this place, what the world calls fanaticism and the church calls extremism, God calls normal. We're just scratching to get back to normal here, friends. We're just scratching to get back to the New Testament norm. When we see people weeping at these altars, when I see Steve pouring his heart out night in, night out, when I see these people laboring and serving and sacrificing, I'm saying, we're getting back to normal. When people are instantly turned around and set ablaze and joined to the church, we're getting back to normal. That's the way it's supposed to be. Pastor always likes me to quote Watchman Nee. By the time the average Christian gets his temperature up to normal, everybody thinks he's got a fever. <laughs> Friends, get a fever. Get hot. Like someone else once said, it's easier to cool down a fanatic than to warm up a corpse. I wish I had some biting quotes today. <laughs> Let me talk to you about prophets. Because we in the New Testament are a prophetic people. We are the fulfillment of the cry of Moses. Oh, that the Lord would make all of his people prophets. We are the fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel. That in the last days God would pour out his spirit on all flesh and they would prophesy. Yes, there are those specially called to prophetic ministry, and there are those who are specifically given the gift of prophecy, but every New Testament believer, and in particular every New Testament leader, should be a prophetic person. What are some of the characteristics? Because this is the kind of leadership that will take a revival on to glory. Prophets have had an encounter with God. Everything they do flows from this fact. I'm in the early stages now of, of writing a commentary on Jeremiah and one on Lamentations for the new edition of the New Expositors Bible Commentary, supposed to be out by the year 2000. Zondervan will be putting it out. So I'm in Jeremiah a lot. I'm in these books a lot. And here's Jeremiah. God tells him, everybody's going to come against you. The prophets are going to come against you. The priests are going to come against you. The princes are going to come against you. The people are going to come against you. Everybody's going to come against you. But I'm going to make you steadfast. He didn't have signs and wonders and miracles. He had an encounter with God. Think of it. Yeah. He could have just been a teenager. There's no way to know exactly how old he is, how he was, how old he was when he was called. Could have just been a teenager. Could have been 15 years old, 18 years old. God says, I'm calling you, and I'm making you a fortified city, and I'm calling you to uproot, to destroy, to tear down, to tear up, to build, and to plant. And Jeremiah is sometimes agonized in secret before God. He said, you deceive me. Or more literal translation, you seduced me, you overpowered me. All I do is prophesy destruction. I haven't borrowed, I haven't lent, and the whole land curses me. 
And yet he'd never back down. He'd agonized before God, but when he tried to hold it in, he said, your word was in my heart like a fire shut up in my bones. I couldn't hold it back. I can do no other. Listen to what Spurgeon said. A man who has really within him the inspiration of the Holy Ghost calling him to preach cannot help it. He must preach. As fire within his bones, so will that influence be until it blazes forth. Friends may check him. The man is indomitable. He must preach if he has the call of heaven. He said, I think it is no more possible to make a man cease from preaching if he is really called than to stay some mighty cataract by seeking in an infant's cup to catch the rushing torrent. The man has been moved of heaven. Who shall stop him? He has been touched by God. Who shall impede him? One Jewish scholar looking at the prophets said they must have been shattered by some cataclysmic experience. See, there's that encounter with God. Have you had an encounter with God? A truly saving encounter, a truly calling encounter. Can you say, I shall not be moved? That's the prophetic vision. That's the prophetic heart. That's the way revival leadership has to go because revival's going against the grain, friends. Revival's presupposing that something is wrong and we're recovering that which was lost, so we're going against the grain. Revival is accelerated because we're trying to recover and recapture things that we should have had long ago. Must be that vision. I will not be moved. I don't care. I love people, I love submission, I love authority. It's a delight, it's a dream for me to work with these brothers and serve day and night with them. It's a dream. I, I love the camaraderie, I love the sense of security we have. And I know if it's ever needed, there's accountability for me here. But I tell you, my ultimate place of accountability, the same for every one of us, is on our knees in the face of God. I'm only here today because years ago, when there was a move of God in the church where I was in leadership, it was clear that there was a division over what God was doing. Some liked it the old way. And we all met together, the pastor and all the leaders. And most of my friends went in there. We knew what our convictions were. And I watched to my astonishment every single one of them turn from their convictions. And there was a vote at the end, and it was 16 to 1. I was the one. But they wanted to win me over, so they gave the vote in reverse, and that was 1 versus 16. How many say no? 16 to 1. How many say yes? 1 to 16. Just trying to appeal to me. Hugged the pastor and said, I've got to step down. I've got to get out of the way. No, stay on the leadership. I said, I can't because I can't support what's happening. I mean, he's been here at this revival, that very same pastor said to me with tears a couple years ago, if God moves again, he said, I don't want to blow it. But I remember saying to myself, there's no way I can leave this meeting. I remember turning 28 on my face, weeping on the floor of the bathroom, 1983. I said, I could never look God in the eye if I compromised on this. I said, I could never go home and look my wife in the eye because I knew she was inflexible and immovable when it came to truth. I knew I could compromise with people, but I could never look her in the eye because she knew what was right. Have you had that encounter with God? One Swedish scholar said, the prophet belongs entirely to his God. His paramount task is to listen to and obey his God. In every respect, he has given himself up to his God and stands unreservedly at his disposal. Prophets are called, commissioned, and compelled. They are commanded and controlled and, and constrained. The commission constrains them. The command compels them. The call controls their lives. See, when God's fire starts burning in you, you may be the only one that feels it. See, here we are, everyone talking about revival, hungry for revival, but still it's an individual thing. You may go back home and the ministers in your community are all talking about revival, but when they say revival and you say it, you mean two different things. Come on, Mike. Come on, Mike. You know what I'm talking about? Yes. One pastor told me, he said, what's happening in such and such city? 
He has a prestigious church in his city. In fact, he confessed to me right before I preached in his church because I had read some poem publicly while he was here one meeting called Wither Persecution, Whatever Happened to Persecution. And I talked about our churches with bowling alleys and so on. And he took me aside right before the meeting. He's a fine man with a fine church. And he gave me a little grin. He said, I just have to confess, our church has a bowling alley. And by the way, God can send revival to a church with bowling alleys. Probably, though, there'll be less bowling. More thunder, but not from the pens. God's moving in his church, and he set his course. If none go with him, he's going. He has set his course. I, w I, I watched as the power of God fell. I felt led to pray for all the leaders on the platform that night. Beautiful church. I mean, lovely, gorgeous buildings, chandeliers and everything, and lovely steps up to the platform. And I felt led to just call up all the leaders and pray for them on the platform. And you could tell as the power of God hit them and the people went crazy that this was not the norm. The shouts and the excitement. But God was just saying, I'm going to move. And they said, move, Lord. Right in front of our people, move, Lord. Get me on my face, move, Lord. And he said to me, you know, what's how? He said, I visited another church and they had a sign in front that said revival, but there are only 50 people there. Now, you might have revival with 50 people, but this was a church saying, oh, revival, revival, revival. They put a sign in front. Maybe they had a touch some months ago or a year ago, but the fire had gone out, but they're still saying revival. It's like the church that one man passed in California and said revival every night except Monday. <laughs> True story, he drove a little bit further and saw another sign that said revival every Monday. Now, you can have revival meetings. We have breaks in revival meetings, but the revival goes on. You may go back home and say, I've got to have revival. And everyone says, oh, great, let's have revival. We'll bring in this, we'll bring in this, we'll have a special meeting, put a sign. You say, no, that's not what I mean. Sometimes you're all alone. Sometimes you say, am I crazy? If you've never wondered that, if in the depth of your soul you've never asked, God, is, have I gone too far? Then I wonder if you've gone far enough. You know what I'm talking about? Say, God, the burden's so intense. There's a dying world. Doesn't anybody see it? You feel like that sometimes. Doesn't anybody care? God's just stretching you. There may be 10 million other people out there feeling exactly the same as you do. Oh, but you're bursting. The prophets felt the blast from heaven. Listen to what this Jewish scholar, Heschel, said. To a person endowed with prophetic sight, everyone else appears blind. To a person whose ear perceives God's voice, everyone else appears deaf. The prophet's word is a scream in the night. While the world is at ease and asleep, the prophet feels the blast from heaven. Friends, revival is a blast from heaven. God comes down and you can never be the same. Once you've been touched by revival, you can never go back to the old way. Oh, the intensity of the move might not be exactly the same, but since I was reawakened in 82, 83 with revival fire, after a time of spiritual coldness and theological and intellectual pride, although I was ministering and serious with God, and we were taking in the refugees from around the world and taking in homeless and taking a, a baby and the, the unwed mother and caring for them, helping to feed the poor and all. We were doing all these good works, but the power wasn't there and the passion was leaving from my life. When God reawakened me and when that church, those dear people, the majority turned against what the Holy Spirit was doing, there was something deep in me ever since. Wherever I go, I've got to see revival. Whatever it takes. And if all we can do is plant seeds, plant seeds, plant seeds, get people hungry, get them praying, get them repenting, get them lifting their eyes for revival, then we'll do it until the glory comes. When you felt that blast from heaven, you can never go back. We're coming to the end here, just a few more points. Prophets know that the power of the message depends on the penetration in their own heart. They only do to others what God has done to them. I always refer to these days in America of microwave ministry. Instant results with no preparation. You know, I have these little cliches, fast food faith that produces biodegradable believers. But see, we want to go to a soul-winning seminar, but we don't want to have a heart broken for the lost. Where you cry yourself to sleep because there's such a place as hell, and you don't want to believe it, but it's true. 
and you can't get away from it? Oh no, show me the four steps to leading people to Jesus. Show me the formula. Oh brother, I want your healing anointing, but you don't want to burn with compassion. You don't want that long suffering to stay in there with the sick person all day and all night, all day and all night. I had a friend that sat by the bed of a dying man four days and four nights, didn't eat, didn't drink, didn't sleep. The guy died. He gave it his best shot. Oh, I, I just want, just touch me. Just touch me so I can get it. We want that anointing to prophesy, but we don't want to be shattered with a vision of a holy God in a sinning world. You know, we sing that song, and I love it, Take Me Into the Holy of Holies. But I wonder if we think about what we're singing. We've got that kind of blissful, worshipful look on our faces. You know, head cocked slightly. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I stand. I don't think so. Take the coal. Next time you're at a barbecue, Sing that song. Take the coal, touch my lips, here I stand. You really want to be a prophet. You really want to be an evangelist. You really want to be in healing ministry. You really want to be a pastor, a shepherd. Why is it that the messages penetrate here? Because they come from a heart that's been penetrated. Yes. Yes. To quote Heschel again, the prophets must have been shattered by some cataclysmic experience in order to be able to shatter others. There's one curse in much of the world today. It is superficial ministry. Friends of mine from out of the country come in. Some of them are here, missionary friends. They come into America and they're shocked with the latest fad. One friend of mine was ministering in India and they told him about the martyr's graveyard where they bring prospective preachers and they stand there by the graves of fellow workers who've been martyred for the faith and say, will you preach? Do you still feel called to preach? We all know for me to live is Christ and to die is gain, Philippians 1.21. But do we know Philippians 1.20? I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now, as always, Christ may be glorified in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me to live is Christ and to die is gain. God's got hold of you. What can man do to you? Prophets cannot back up back down, shut up, or shut down. I preached a message once in Israel and people said to me, oh, what courage you had to preach this message. I said, the lion roared, who can but fear? You know, here you are in front of a cave and there's a 50 foot drop into the water, to the lake beneath you, standing on the side of a mountain and all of a sudden you hear a lion roar and somebody sees you fly out jumping into that water. What courage? Friends, there's no courage. I heard the lion roar and I was in the water. The lion has roared, who can but fear? Amos 3, the Lord God has spoken, who can but prophesy? It's in my bones, man, it's in my blood. You know, we've been in settings, we've been in India where we're told if you preach on this, the people will get angry. They've killed people here. And God says, get up and preach on that. Get up and go into a Hindu stronghold where the people are fanatical worshipers of this goddess, Kanaka Durga. God has me go in there and preach. Invite all the Hindu priests and everyone to come and go in there and preach. Is Durga the real God, Kanaka Durga, or is Yahweh the real God? Say so it took courage, it didn't take courage any more than it took courage to get out of bed in the morning, to sit down and have a meal. You had an encounter with God, what are you going to do? Oh, great message, not a great message. Man, you're pouring yourself out, we're doing nothing. We're unprofitable servants, what else are you going to do when God gets hold of you? Oh it's not God. radical for a servant to do his master's will. Oh God says, lay down your life as a martyr, what a privilege. I can't imagine what it would be like to go through the torture and suffering that other saints have gone through and are going through this very day. But sometimes I think, man, I'm jealous of the reward they're going to get in heaven, the privilege of suffering for Jesus that they've had. 
You've heard the Lord God speak, friends, you can't ever move back. Prophets willingly accept reproach and rejection. Why? Because they're called to address a sinning generation that reviles God. They're going to be reviled too. You know the famous words of Joseph Parker. Ravenhill quoted them in Why Revival Tarries. Keith Green went away on a prayer retreat reading Why Revival Tarries and wrote the famous song, if you knew his music, I Pledge My Head to Heaven. It's from what Joseph Parker said. The man whose little sermon is repent sets himself against his age and will for the time being be battered mercilessly by the age whose moral tone he challenges. There is but one end for such a man, off with his head. You had better not try to preach repentance until you have pledged your head to heaven. You want to follow God in revival, the world may come against you. The religious establishment may come against you. Friends may forsake you, but you have the smile of God. You have the smile of God, and you will end up touching more lives than you ever could have imagined. And you'll end up with more soulmate friends for life than you ever could have imagined. And if you lay down your life together, what a joy. Friends, it's time for a generation of prophetic, God-consumed, obedient to death, spirit-anointed leaders to arise. It's going to take that to lead us into the fullness of revival. The wind is going to be stiff in our face. Listen to Spurgeon. He's talking about his preaching. He said, if you get fellowship with Christ, I care little for the merits of my sermon or the perils of your criticism. One thing alone I crave, let him kiss us with the kisses of his mouth. Then shall my soul be well content and so will yours be also. I want you to stand to your feet together with me. Brad, could you just come back over? We're going to close. We're going to give you an opportunity to respond. John Wesley visited a little place in England called Swanage, and he made this observation. I preached there last year. That's why I looked it up in his journals to see if he'd been there. He said, I fear the preachers have been more studious to please than to awaken. Otherwise, the work would have been deeper. Otherwise, the work would have been deeper. Puritan author said, preachers are physicians and not cooks. Therefore, they should not study to delight the palate, but to recover the patient. It's time to put down being politicians, and it's time to put down being professionals, and it's time to become a prophetic people, to lead the way the end of this millennium, just with a path to glory until Jesus comes. Father, in the name of Jesus, strip away every facade, strip away the outward habits that we've learned to cover for the absence of anointing and passion. Turn our hearts back Set us ablaze. No more politicians, no more professionals, but a prophetic body. In the name of Jesus. Brad's going to sing, wash me clean. If God's dealing with you, right where you are, you can get on your knees, you can come to this altar and just spend a few minutes before the Lord. If this is message was for you, if God's speaking to you, respond publicly right now. Get on your knees, get on your face, come up to this altar, repent before the Lord. Then after a season here, we'll go on to the next session. If God was speaking to you, then you respond, and he'll meet you. Grace will be poured out. He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. He gives grace to the humble. God is for you. Humble yourself in his sight. He'll use you. Jesus. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. I want to be holy, cleansed.
God's dealing with you. Come on, respond, folks. I want to be yes, Lord. only living for the glory. God is dealing with you. Come down from the balcony. Come out from your seat. Get in the aisle. Get on your knees. Say, I'm not going to be a professional. I'm not going to be a politician. Give me a prophet of God, a revival leader, a servant doing his master's will. Help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. Forgive us. Forgive us. We want to see revival. We want to see revival. We want to see you visit. Oh, God. The show does not have to go on. Very image of your son. Wash us clean, Lord. Wash us clean, Lord. Wash me clean. Forgive us. I want to be holy. Jesus. Cleanse my heart. I want to be only living for the glory of the whole. God's not out to get you, friends. He's out to bless you. He's out to use you. He's out to help you. He's not ignorant of the labor, the tears, the effort, the frustration, the brokenness, the opposition. He's not ignorant. Jesus. It's a day of grace, friends. Oh, God. Oh, that all the Lord's people would be prophets, that he would pour out his spirit on each of them. Jesus. It's his strength. It's his anointing. It's his calling. He'll do it. It's his power. It's his authority. It's his church. It's his world. determination by the grace of God. You're going to lead this conference different. You're going to lead this conference different. Test me. Forgiveness. There's forgiveness. 
there's cleansing. There's a fountain of love flowing. It's not too late. It's not too late. Have mercy. Search me, Jesus, oh God. Jesus. And know. Stay a few more minutes in his presence. When you catch sight of Jesus, friends, <laughs> when you catch sight of Jesus, going to disappoint you. You died for us, Lord. You intercede for us. You sent your spirit. We're not going to disappoint you, Lord. I love you, Jesus. Holy I love you, Jesus. Lamb of God, who makes new life begin. He makes new life begin. He makes new life begin. Jesus. Those of you that need to stay on your knees or on your faces, that's just fine. I'm going to invite others to stand and just to give yourself to the Lord as we worship Him, as we sing this to Him, just to give yourself to Him without reserve, to follow Him at any cost, to obey Him, no matter what the consequence, to pray that for your own life. If you need to stay on your knees, that's just fine. So offer ourselves to God. Your tears are precious in His sight. 
Jesus. He sees everyone. He said to Hezekiah, I've seen your tears, I've heard your cry. Oh, new beginnings. It's what we're here for, friends. This is what it's all about. Glorifying Jesus while we have breath. Jesus. Behold. Takes away our sins. Who takes away our sins? The Holy Lamb of the God. Holy Lamb, the Holy Lamb of God. Who makes new life begin? Who makes new life? Sing begin. Jesus. 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 We love Jesus you, Lord. Is the Lamb. Jesus is the Lamb. Yes, Lord. Oh. Jesus. Yes. Jesus. Jesus. Sing it again. Jesus. Someone wholly devoted that you can use. Someone holding nothing back through whom you can pour out your spirit. Oh, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Sing one last song of worship together. I love you, Lord. I lift my voice to worship you. Friends, all the other stuff is going to pass. It's going to pass. God may call you from the crowds to minister in the backwoods somewhere. He may call you to the ends of the earth where nobody even knows your name. But he'll know your name. And you'll see his face. And if he's pleased, that's all that matters. There's only one I want to please. There's only one I want to impress. There's only one whose attention I want to get. The one who sits on the throne. Jesus. We offer ourselves to you, Lord.
Take joy, my King, in my life. Let it be a sweet, sweet. Take joy in me, Lord. Jesus, 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 Jesus. Jesus, 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 yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, yes, Lord, oh, Savior and Redeemer, Savior. Take joy, take joy, take joy. Lord, please light the fire. Lord, please light the fire that once burned bright.
Jesus. Jesus. As we close this session, hear me. The thing that makes it easy is that he loves us. We're not striving to get his love or working to get his approval in terms of getting him to love us. He set his love on us. He set his love on us. There's never a split second of a day that ever goes by in my life where I doubt in the slightest that he loves me. We need to delight ourselves in the love of God. Friends, be a God-consumed leadership. The church needs you. The world needs you. God's appointed you in this hour. He's entrusted us. He wouldn't have brought us to this point unless he knew there were people in whom he could trust. Let him trust you with more of his travail. Let him trust you with more of his burden. Let him trust you with more of his passion. Let him trust you with more of his holy anointing. Let him trust you with revival. Father, may your blessing be upon us. May your truths be sealed in our hearts. May we forever be changed through your living word. Thank you, Father. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. I believe we're beginning to sense that God is issuing an, a very certain sound, a sure sound. What God is saying in this revival to us is that there is no middle ground. It's not a both and situation, it's an either or. And I don't think it could have been brought home more clearly to us than it has been this morning. So may God take our hearts and lives and mold and shape us and strengthen us. Certainly God does not call us to be offensive or tactless or without feeling for people. But God is calling us to consider him first. And the truth of the matter is that the preaching of the gospel is an offense. It always has been and it always will be. And yet that's what, that's what God has called us to do. Thank you, Mike, for making it so clear, brother. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. God has ever raised up a prophetic voice in an age. He's raised up Michael Brown's voice for this age. And we thank God for him, and we're honored to have him here. Cheryl is going to come. She has some announcements. And so if you'll just stay steady for a couple of minutes, she'll direct you as to what needs to be done. Those of you who need to continue to travail and pray and seek God, you can find a place of refuge someplace. But we're going to move on with the rest of the uh, the agenda now and Cheryl's going to direct you. First off, we need Betty Jean Mun Money to return to Steve Hill's table in the product tent. And also, um, just want to remind you that it's time for Group A to go to sessions. And, excuse me, Group A to go to lunch and Group B to go to sessions. Group A to go to lunch, Group B to go to sessions. And we'll be 30 minutes behind. Just set everything back 30 minutes today. Just follow your schedule. God bless. Can I have Stanley? Your motel room key, room 515. I have a motel room key.